Hello everyone, High Treason here. I've been incredibly busy just lately. And you know, if you've heard me say it once, you'll have heard me say it a thousand times. There are far too many collectors into OEM machines. I think it's absolutely fucking disgusting. Clothes are far more interesting. And mm, you know, I have to admit, I've bought an OEM machine. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, can you guess what I bought? Well, I'll give you a few clues, right, because you'll never get it. It's got PS2 ports for the keyboard and mouse, as opposed to the DIN and serial ports that we'd usually use. It has a 486 DX2 66 MHz processor. It is a socketed processor as well. And we also have three letters in the brand's name. So, who made this machine and what is it? Well, if you guessed IBM, you were completely wrong. I wouldn't be seen dead buying an overweight heap of junk like that. I bought a Leo data book. Unfortunately, I know nothing much about it, aside from what hardware is in there. It had some weird software installed on the 256MB Western Digital Caviar hard drive that came with it. I have my suspicions it was a point of sale system or something. The language there's Bulgarian as far as I know, and that's where it came from. That drive will have an image taken. In the meantime though, I upgraded to a Quantum Fireball 1080MB hard drive. I run DOS 6.2.2 and Windows 4 Outgroups 3.11, which seems to be what it was running before, and it's pretty standard for machines of this specification and this age. I can't emphasise how small that case is. It's dinky. Look at it next to my ITX machine, or a couple of CD-ROM drives. This might be like the desktop equivalent of the Compact Contour Aero. Inside, it's a full-fat machine. We've got a socketed AM486DX266 CPU, allowing for potential upgrades from my new tray of chips. Some of these might be heading over to another collector soon, though. But as I don't have a DX266 machine, I think it'll stay this way, and I'll just call it my DX266, as you're kind of supposed to have one if you're into this stuff, and I kind of like it set up the way it is anyway. Wouldn't recommend shoving your hands in whilst power's connected, as you could probably get a shock from there. And the PSU's open at the bottom there as well, so yeah, you'd probably die. I wonder what this switch does. I haven't actually found out yet, and presumably it's a turbo or green power control, though it seems to do absolutely nothing. Maybe it's BIOS or software in there, it does not need to set it up somewhere in software or the BIOS. But as the LED isn't turbo, I'm stumped as to the function of both. I have a feeling the LED might be intended for network activity and it's just not working, though it flashes on for a moment when you power on or off the machine. Still, if that's the biggest issue we've got here, that's probably a good sign, right? Reset is in a hole there, so you can't hit it by accident, so we do know that the switch isn't the reset switch. The award bias signature is a bit unusual, and the one displayed in the setup matches three motherboards as far as I can tell, none of which are this motherboard. Maybe this is one of those illegal biases. The CPU has no L2 cache, and it can't be changed. At least it's honest, and it doesn't try to lie about having it like some PC chips motherboards do. The system came with 8 megabytes of fast page DRAM installed, and I upgraded to a single 16 megabyte module that was left over from the 586. This module seems to work fine in later tests with other boards, but I'll be quick to blame it if something stops working somewhere. Speaking of stuff not working, the floppy drive doesn't work. I'm sure I can get another one though, it appears to be pretty standard laptop part, as in the ones they used to use in laptops in the early 90s. I suspect the interface never really changed. Sod's Law states the one that I have spare already has a different ribbon. Still, now I've got an excuse to get one for my Zenith Slim Sport 286 as well, so, you know, I've wanted to fix that for a while. Maybe we'll take a look at it if I do. There's an Axon Any Ethernet card built in, so forget floppies anyway. Get MTCP or the Windows TCP IP stack and use the network. There's a Cirrus GD5429 graphics chip too. Someone appears to have upgraded the memory to a megabyte, I think. The system features most things you'd need built in. 
You can pretty much run on its own without need for expansion cards. Just as well, really, because only one ISA slot's included on this riser. I think I'll throw a Sound Blaster 2.0 in there if the onboard Ethernet works. You see, there was a 3COM 509 card installed, and I'm hoping it was just there for its BNC connector and not because the onboard UK0022 was broken. I suppose we could use Laplink. Nah, it turns out the onboard works just fine. It's an NE2000 clone, which is cool because those things work with absolutely everything ever made. Or near enough. There's not much else to say on the internals, besides I do like the look of the machine. I actually bought it slightly based on what it looks like, which is really unlike me. I'm more of a practical man, but this thing looks like something you'd see in some 80s or 90s futuristic cyberpunk movie or something, like Nirvana or Johnny Mnemonic. I don't know, I just couldn't resist it. Now we need one of them crazy see-through monitors or something like you always get in them films. Well, let's benchmark it. It seems about right in the 180 zone in top bench. My Pentium 60 with all its mic can only pull off around 220 in this test. So Leo also has a working D-Turbo from the regular keyboard shortcut, in case you were wondering about that, there it is. NSSI appears to be consistent with what we've seen. My Pentium 60 disappoints again. An AM4860X4100, the one we looked at some time ago, seems consistent with this machine's score. Rather disappointingly, you can't adjust memory timings and such a great deal in the BIOS, but as I seriously doubt something like this was aiming for the performance market, given the machine seems to be from the mid-90s, I'm not going to begrudge it for these lack of settings at all, as why would you need them on a machine that's not for performance? I mean, come on. Demo time. This machine clearly wasn't used for anything like this, so we're about to take it to a level it's never been to before. Good luck, little Leo. Well, it runs hot, given there's only a single 40mm fan to cool everything down. You know, I might try and squeeze a centrifugal blower into the box, you know, like the ones you can buy for the expansion slots on regular machines. But we've run into the shadows just fine. That's not bad for a cash register, is it? The law says I have to run second reality on it. And that also runs great. Obviously we have the Sound Blaster 2.0 installed. Well, it seems to work just fine. Gaming. A lot of games recommend such a CPU. So terminal velocity is playable. Duke Nukem 3D, just about playable, I haven't tested it extensively, and Realms of the Haunting would work, I expect, except we don't actually have a CD-ROM drive, and there's no perceivable way to install one. Interestingly, the drive controller does support two drives, meaning it is theoretically possible to run a line out of the box and have one externally hooked up to the controller if it actually supports them. Of course, any game that doesn't want a CD generally runs in one way or another. The 4860X266 was known as a good all-rounder and it uses 33 MHz bus speed, which was generally more stable than 25, 40 and 50 MHz offerings. Also, faster chips like the DX4 generally went all that much faster if you configured things properly on the DX266. Whilst it won't blaze through a lot of games, they will run in a playable manner. To be honest, I've said it before, one thing I like with machines like this is even when it's not playable, you don't see the machine complaining about it, it just runs it to the best of its abilities. If you start cranking settings up in these games, it's not always playable but it's still well, running. Whilst it's not fair to compare it, it does show the efficiency the of the routines in the Into the Shadows demo, doesn't it? It goes without saying, Doom Engine games and similar titles will run quite well on hardware like this. Strife, one of the more demanding games on the Doom Engine, runs very well actually. I've not had any trouble with that whatsoever. Windows works. Generally I just use this to make managing files or accessing the network and shares easier on these machines. The Sound Blaster's a bit useless for MP3 playback. Uh, this is some music I composed today, it's nothing you haven't heard before. Trying to avoid future copyright notices, uh, yeah, sorry Germany if you wanted to watch my 586 video there, it won't be that.
but I can't help wonder if a remote desktop client is a possibility, as a thing like this would be a pretty nifty box to move around if I wanted to run DOS games somewhere unusual, whilst being able to access a newer machine as well. I mean, that's all I ever use my laptop for, but that thing really doesn't work properly. Oh, fucking yeah! Seems you can do Windows type things just fine, like run Microsoft Office too. Would you agree if I said the interface here appeals to me a bit more than the stupid ribbon they have now? This thing at least attempted to be usable and functional. There's not a lot else I can really think to say about the machine. Again, it works as well as it needs to. There's some wear and tear, and you can see where the previous owner mended the case, also the power switch mechanisms bodged. With blue tack, I did that. Uh, cheap plastic, standard switch, don't really care. It's part of history. This machine's history. It tells a story. So the Leo data book's a really nifty little machine. It's both novel thing to earn for its small size, as well as being a practical thing to earn because it actually works properly. There's enough on board to make the expansion really unnecessary beyond where it is, in my application at least, but let's hope nothing that's built in breaks down because we won't be able to replace it. It would have been nice to have the option of an L2 cache, but the machine was probably designed to be cheap and cache grade memory tends to cost quite a lot of money. Anyway, the cheaply made ones always turn out to be the most fun, maybe because you kind of snort arrogantly at first glance. Maybe you expect it to not work, or perform horribly. But when it works, it feels good. They always seem to have a personality, if you understand what I mean. I mean, picture this, you buy a uh, one, like, wow, sorry, $10,000 workstation, and you use it to render some video. The video completes rendering successfully in not a lot of time, perfectly fine. That's good, but imagine you don't actually have that much money and you do the same thing with that cellar on you picked up on the side of the road that somebody was throwing away. Well, I tell you which one's going to give you more satisfaction, which one you're going to feel better about, which one you're going to have the most fun with when you try to make it do something. Which one's it going to be? You know that cellar on's a hell of a lot more fun. I'm high treason and I really can't think of anything else much to say. Uh, that's about it, really. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again in the near future. I left the machine sitting for 20 minutes. Power management enabled. Orange LED comes on, screen goes black. Must be a sleep LED. That switch I don't know about. Maybe that's a suspend switch and it doesn't work. I don't know. There you go, press space, screen comes back, it goes out. That switch doesn't seem to do anything. On the other hand, we never set the operating system up to have power management, so... Because I generally don't have it on. I only turned it on to see what would happen if there was any way of making that come on. So that, that's obviously the standby light. That's unusual, you don't usually see that on these. Cool.